Good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to the last session of the scientific talks on the second day we are. And in this session that we will talk about uh, application of fluorescence lifetime with dark ratio microscopy in clinical diagnosis and simultaneous fluorescence and phosphorescence uh, lifetime imaging microscopy in uh, sort of addressing biomedical uh, questions as well as Today we would have discussions on different flame analysis and their pros and cons. Our first speaker is uh, Professor Amazi Periyasamy. He received his PhD at the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, and postdoctoral training at the University of Washington, Seattle. Uh, currently, he is a professor in biology and bio biomedical engineering, the di director and founder of internationally known WM Keck Center uh, for Cellular Imaging or KCCI, University of Virginia, Char Charlottesville. And uh, he is one of the pioneers in the development of fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy or FLIM. And the key area of his research is focused on the design and development of optical methodology, including advanced light microscopy techniques to investigate or monitor exogenous and endogenous um, molecular interactions in life cells, tissues, and animals. He has edited three books, series book editor in um, on cellular and clinical imaging in first 11 books. Uh, chairman, uh, chairperson of an annual international conference on multi photon microscopy in the biomedical uh, science through SBIE since 2001 and runs a hands on uh, training annual workshop on flame and threat microscopy at the University of Virginia, uh, Charlottesville during March almost every year. I guess that this year uh, you should postpone it, yeah, to the next year. Am yes, right? yes. Yes, yeah, that, that was an unfortunate. <laughs> 2021, there is no workshop. Yeah, so since 2002, I think it was running nonstop till 2020, which was yes. full of surprises. The stage is yours, please. Thank you very much, Ali, for your nice introduction. And thanks for the organizer uh, for uh, inviting me to give this talk. Uh, uh, the beginner's gate to fluorescence lifetime imaging in life sciences. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so these are the players in our group, uh, Sagupta, Zdenek, and Host. Uh, they are all pretty much involved in this uh, NADH work. And um, KCK is uh, a tissue culture uh, person, and uh, Rufon is also uh, involved in the NADH imaging, cost and data analysis, and Daniel and Jayashin is on uh, machine learning of uh, uh, doing the data analysis part. And the funding is from various uh, organizations. So we are working on uh, uh, different uh, microscopy technique, mainly focused on fluorescence lifetime imaging. Uh, as Ali mentioned, the FRED workshop next year, usually in March, next year, 2021, there will not be any workshop because of this pandemic and the virus situation, no one will come. Uh, we are working on the NADH work since 2012. We are working on mitochondrial dysfunction in prostate cancer, cervical and leukemia cancer. And recently we started on Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so this talk mainly focused on uh, what are the optical artifacts involved when we measure the redox ratio, which is the measure of the metabolism. Uh, and also we introduced uh, using a single wave in the excitation uh, to detect the NADH and the FAD. I will cover these two topics in my presentation. Uh, treatment and diagnosis of prostate cancer is a much debated subject. Usually when you go to the hospital, if you are over 40 or 50, they usually take the PSA, uh, specific prostate specific antigen test. Uh, we started this work, see whether, because that PSA shows only if you, after the cancer is developed, 
uh, four or five you know, values. So if you are less than one and you are okay. So we are trying to see whether we can able to see early detection. Uh, and also they use the needle biopsies. Uh, according to the CDC, Center for Disease Control, uh, the disease, cancer disease is going down because of the, uh, the diagnosis process and uh, the advance in technology uh, really decrease the rate of prostate cancer and they expect it will go down. Uh, we are using the, as I mentioned, fluorescence lifetime imaging. As you all know, it is a better method for quantitation of the signal because uh, lifetime is a nanosecond process. It is sensitive to environmental changes uh, and many even cellular process can be measured. It is insensitive to change in molecule concentration or power of the excitation intensity or light scattering and uh, differential absorption of light in tissue. Uh, as you know, lifetime is an average time measured, how long the molecule stays in the excited state. That process changes uh, depending on the environmental changes, the lifetime value. Uh, it is a very typical Zablonsky diagram of showing measurement of the li lifetime. So it is a exponential decay. The emission is a random process because if a photon goes in and one exhaled molecule, and comes out with the gate F, and the probability of the emission of your photon is exponential uh, because the molecule, when it goes to the x ray it doesn't know where it is. Uh, for example, if a fly gets into the room uh, and it, uh, you know, when we come inside the room, we know how to get out. When the fly gets into the door, we do not know how to get out. The fly do not know how to get out. So it goes through uh, sorry, it, it goes through uh, uh, different uh, situation and loses the energy. The same way the molecule goes to the excited state and it loses the energy. It's a kind of losing the energy. It's kind of exponential decay. The probability of the emission of your photon is exponential. So I, as Ali mentioned, I built the lifetime imaging system in 1996. At that time, there is not a company uh, Introduce the lifetime imaging systems, all the electronics you have to build yourself. And uh, now you have a number of companies available. This is the Becker and Gickel board. Uh, you can easily insert in your computer. If you have a pulse laser, you can do time correlated simple photon counting. My presentation of all the data is based on time correlated simple photon counting. Uh, recent evidence has suggested that cancer should be considered as a metabolic disease. Um, and the growing tumors uh, rewire the metabolic programs uh, to meet and even exceed the bioenergetic, biosynthetic demands of continuous cell growth. Uh, the metabolic profile, profile observed in cancer cells, there is an increase in glycolysis, increase in uh, uh, secretion of lactate, uh, uh, and um, Recent research in the field of cancer metabolism raising few questions. Why do cancer cells shift their metabolism? Are the changes in metabolism in cancer cells a, a consequence of the changes in proliferation or a driver of cancer progression? Uh, can cancer metabol metabolism be targeted to benefit patients? So there are a number of um, molecular amino acids, which is penaline, tyrosine, tryptophan, Tryptophan provides better signal autofluorescence intensity than other amino acids. And we also have the NADH and the FAD, that's why we are going to talk about it, which is a very good uh, uh, biomarker. Uh, and the tryptophan and the NADH and the FAD, you can see the excitation and the emission spectrum. And uh, clearly you see uh, the found and free, we talk about it, this uh, information. Uh, it is, we can use this NADH FAD as a autofluorescence biomarker. It is a non-invasive approach. No labeling is required. Fluorescent properties of the endogenous fluorophores in their native environment. Fluorescent properties of endogenous fluorophores are sensitive to change in their cellular microenvironment. 
The change in redox ratio, for example, due to metabolic alteration, changes in the coenzyme of NADH concentration, thereby total NADH out of fluorescence intensity. Uh, the importance of difference, the free and, fr uh, free and protein bound NADH, you can see, you can clearly see the free lifetime of NADH is 0.4 nanosecond and the NADH bound lifetime changes between 2.4 to 4 nanosecond depending on the specimen or tissue. Uh, flavin exists predominantly in the mitochondria with a negligible concentration in cytosol and nucleus. Uh, the FAD is covalently bound in the mitochondria and only in the mitochondria complex too. Uh, in this FAD is free is about three nanosecond, bound is about 0.3 nanosecond. Uh, so as you know, we are talking about mitochondria is a, a energy source of the cellular function. And if there is any dysfunction of the mitochondrial dysfunction is an issue for all the diseases. Almost uh, if any disease is uh, always connected to the mitochondrial dysfunction. So that's what we are trying to investigate. In my presentation, now I'm going to show you uh, regarding the NADH uh, response for drug cellular uptake, uh, glucose is degraded to fibrovate upon reduction of NAD plus to NADH in the cytoplasm. Pyruvate is preferably converted to acetyl coenzyme A and fit into the Krebs cycle uh, in the mitochondrial matrix. Uh, the proton gradient uh, uh, built up over the inner mitochondrial membrane is used by complex five uh, to convert uh, uh, ADP to ATP. This is a kind of, uh, of biological information. So the terminology I may use in this presentation is uh, coenzyme NADH, which I already mentioned, and FAD. And the prostate cancer cell will be using as a specimen, and the drug is toxorubicin. Uh, we'll be using multi-photon or uh, two-photon fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy, and we'll be using the time correlated single photon counting from Becker and Kickel uh, instruments uh, companies. The data analysis, we developed a flare, and uh, also we are using machine learning approach. Uh, this is the system. This is the size, size 780 is used uh, to collect all the data which I am going to show. We have a three photo of uh, flint detector for tryptophan, NADH and FAD at the focal plane. You can simultaneously collect uh, three signals from the specimen. Uh, we'll be using tryptophan three photon excitation and NADH and FAD two photon excitation. Uh, the wavelength is mentioned here. This is 740 uh, for NADH, FAD, 890. So we are mainly focusing on in this presentation on NADH and FAD. So as you see, the NADH signal here shown from the cytoplasmic area, green color, the, and then we targeted with the mitochondria to, to label the uh, mitochondrial labeling. You can see co-localization of the NADH signal on the mitochondria. Um, clearly shows the yellowish color. What we are measuring is the NADH signal is from uh, mitochondria. So the redox ratio is a measure of meta meta metabolism. Increase in metabolic activity is defined as uh, a traditional redox ratio is based on FAD or divided by NADH photon intensity. It is the intensity ratio and an increase in the ratio of the fluorescent FAD to the fluorescent NADH. Uh, the, what we introduced to the new approach is the fluorescence lifetime redox ratio, uh, an increase of this ratio of the fluorescence NADH enzyme bound, which is bound to the protein fraction here two percent on the fluorescent FAD enzyme bound fraction year one percent. Um, so when you fit the data after collecting an ADH image, you can see two component analysis. We are using two component analysis. The year one person is free and the year two person is bound enzyme. Um, and the FAD, the bound is year one person, the free is year two person. Uh, so why we developed the FLIR approach? We use the redox ratio calculation using the intensity-based approach 
And when we went for the live animal imaging, uh, we found out that there is the results were all over the place. It is not reproducible. It may be due to the uh, different excitation intensity used in varying depths. Maybe it may be differential absorption and scattering in the tissue. The results are not reproducible, some say all over the place. That's why we went with the biologically disconnect bound ratio of the bound NADH to uh, bound FAD. You can see the results are very reproducible, very normal. The first two points is on the surface of the tissue. So that's how we try to use the flare, which, which reduces the optical artifacts involved in the measurement. There is nothing wrong in the intensity-based measurement, but this method increases the sensitivity of the measurement in cells and the tissue because of it is getting rid of the optical artifacts involved uh, in, due to light scattering. So clearly you see the cells, the tumor uh, issue, uh, tissue and the normal tissue, which clearly shows the same pattern as the a cell versus a tissue culture cells. So clearly we are measuring the right signal. So how do you characterize any new approach you develop? You have to test uh, characterization of this method. What we did is we developed, uh, yeah, uh, you know, the mitochondria in the cytoplasm is not distributed all over the place. And also in cancer, the glycolysis plays a major role. So you can, in, at least in the cytoplasm. So you can, by using a, a region of interest, just selecting uh, the mitochondrial area alone, you can clearly uh, discriminate uh, the different, the, uh, the oxfast takes place in the mitochondria, the, the glycolysis takes place in the cytoplasm. We can clearly discriminate, uh, estimate these two signals by using this approach. Our software works automatically to detect this mitochondrial area with uh, region of interest two by two pixels. So we were able to reproduce the results. Uh, so we can clearly see we, uh, this is the whole cell at the bottom graph I am showing you. And it is the mito area. We categorized with uh, minimum, medium, and higher level response of this NADH signal. You can clearly see the heterogeneous distribution of this signal clearly monitored using this technique. Uh, how do you test with this? So if you use a cobalt chloride, which blocks the connection between the Krupp cycle and Oxfos, so that way we can able to test whether uh, the technique is very sensitive uh, in the measurement of the uh, Rax ratio. Uh, so here you see that, oops, yeah. Uh, we used uh, uh, overnight, we treated these cells with the 50 micromolar cobalt chloride. Uh, and then it is in control as a control since complex one is a major binding partner for NADH bound coenzyme and it inhibit the cobalt chloride causes the NADH, uh, the FLIR ratio or NADH FAD ratio to decrease. And then later we challenge us with the 20 millimolar glucose uh, in a medium and keep it for 30 minutes to re-image to see whether we can see the glucose information. So as you see here, um, oops. As you see here, this is the intensity ratio on the top panel and the bottom panel is glucose treatment. Uh, you can clearly see uh, the gobar chloride block the uh, signal uh, of the NADH uh, information and the glucose, after adding the glucose, you can see the response of the bound coenzyme or the relax ratio. The x-axis is relax ratio, uh, flare, and the uh, y-axis is the relative frequency, number of pixels. Uh, you can see the arrow mark indicates the, between the intensity versus the FLIR. You can see the sensitivity increase in uh, using this FLIR approach. So we also applied this LINCAP cells, which is very highly responsive. Uh, uh, and clearly you see the LINCAP is very highly responsive for the drug and the, and the African-American cancer cells is less responsive. You can also notice that after 45 or 60 minutes, the morphology of the cell is changing. So there may be a, a is taking place during this 
measurements and we clearly see the ROS production during the 60 minutes. We use the Mitosox red on one micromolar toxobibicin to see the ROS production. The basically, you can see the apoptosis takes place after 12 hours and which can be tested by monitoring the signal threat between NADH and tryptophan. And you can clearly see the in energy transfer efficiency increases. The tryptophan is the donor and the NADH is an acceptor bound NADH. But after apoptosis, you see the morphology of the cell decreased and as well as this, uh, the, there is no energy transfer. The blue color represents the control and it's clearly there is no change in the energy transfer between uh, tryptophan and uh, NADH. And we also tested with the biopsy, prostate cancer tissue biopsy for using the fluid approach. Uh, this is the normal area on the top panel and the bottom panel is a cancer tissue. And you can clearly see with the intensity based method, it jumps all over the place. And whereas in the fluid approach, uh, we can able to reproduce the results and reproducible and it does not some jump all over the place. Uh, the labeling on the x-axis is the patient uh, number. We may not be able to reproduce that. We, uh, they will not give you the, only the patient numbers. And we are testing this approach in the clinical uh, samples. And uh, I'm not supposed to show you the results. And we are comparing with the PSA. It's really, a, we are able to uh, monitor uh, using this fluid approach with the PSA. Uh, comparison is very, very good within four to five percent error. So now I will show you the, so far we, you, we showed you the uh, fluid approach and how we are monitoring the signal, how we calculated using the region of interest uh, to differentiate between oxfos and uh, glycolysis in the, middle, in the cell, prostate cancer cells, in the limb cap and African-American cancer cell line and using the toxobibicin drug. And uh, now we, okay, we used all this approach and uh, we, we, we showed the flare approach, but how we can improve, you still, you see the crowd. It is, it is not that clearly response we can see using the flare approach. So we use the machine learning with uh, another collaborator. Take and you see clearly, this is the flare, and here you see the response. You can clearly see within 30 minutes uh, of, uh, after the drug addition, the increase in the response of the drug. Whereas it is very crowded in the flare approach, we have to really pay attention when the drug response is takes place. The, really, it helps. Machine learning is helps. Uh, now I am trying to show you in another 10 minutes, maybe. Uh, so as you know, the mitochondria moves around uh, in the live cells, particularly in the neuronal cells, it is too much movement. If you want to switch between 740 for NADH and the FAD is 890, uh, where we, will get, we are using all the data I showed you is that is how I collected. So now after that, we realized that uh, this is too much of uh, the laser stabilization tuning from one to the uh, 740 to 890. So we decided to select the appropriate wavelength to single wavelength to get an ADH and the FAD signal. In brief, uh, the 800 nanometer we have chosen to get, uh, we get the NADH signal and as well as FAD. FAD is very brighter than NADH as you know, 740 is the peak signal for NADH, peak excitation. But 800, we do get enough photon counts uh, to fit for two component, uh, expo two component uh, fitting. It is working very well uh, for 740 nanometer, for 800 nanometer. So as I mentioned before, the mitochondrial moves around and it is difficult to, for depending on your experimental condition, the, the mitochondria moves, you are, if your detection between time zero to 60 minutes will be different. So the emission signal, which we selected is as shown here, uh, 450 to 50 nanometer for the NADH 
on the F-80-560-280 nanometer, we use the NADH uh, on the F-80 solution so that we can test this idea of 800 nanometer and then we used for cells. Uh, so here you can show, clearly I show you here, uh, the excitation wavelength in the x-axis, you can see at 800, you clearly see uh, there is not much of a bleed through. In the previous slide, I see I show you the NADH signal bleeding through to the emission of the FAD signal. This also you can avoid by using the 800 nanometer excitation instead of using 740 nanometer. Even though we are using the near band pass filter for FAD, there is a possibility of bleeding through of the NADH signal. So, uh, so here you see clearly at the 800 nanometer, the bleed through is very, very low, which cannot be detected by non-linear least square fitting with the, with the lifetime data. So we also tested in cells. It also shows the bleed through is very, very low compared to uh, at the 800 nanometer. So here I showed you clearly, so you can see the, you can argue that 740 nanometer, you will be less photons compared to the FAD signal is very bright signal. You can see at 800 nanometer. So, but it is, as I mentioned, it is sufficient photons we can collect for, uh, for NADH signal. So you can see 740 nanometer on your left side, 800 nanometer of the NADH, it is an intensity image, not lifetime image. And this is the 890 nanometer for FAD signal. This is the 800 nanometer for, uh, for FAD signal. So it is very brighter for compared to 890 versus 800. We scanned a different wavelength and found out 800 is the ideal wavelength for FAD excitation, not 890 you can see here. So we, then we measure with the lifetime, it clearly shows the NADH in the FAD lifetime is very reproducible for at the 800 nanometer uh, excitation. So then we used about the same idea what we used for uh, the prostate cancer cells. It's a link cap cells. You can clearly see 800 nanometer excitation on the 740 nanometer excitation. This is the enzyme bound, the A2 person. You can, the pattern remains the same, 740 versus 800 nanometer. You can see the control is a uh, solid line and the response for uh, one hour and two hour, you can clearly see the pattern remains almost the same. Yes, it's absolute numbers in the photon count number for 800 nanometers is less for uh, NADH signal. And here for the 800 nanometer for FAD, uh, A1 person bound one and 890 nanometer here, you can see clearly the signals are brighter than uh, 890 nanometer. Again, the pattern remains the same, solid line is controlled, and uh, the, the drug response, toxoglibicin drug response for one hour and two hour source, and then the fluid value remains the pattern, same at 800 nanometer. So you can use 800 nanometer. Probably the time of data collection should maybe adjusted, or you can reduce the the FAD signal is very brighter than NADH signal. By adjusting the time of the acquisition, you can be able to get enough photon counts uh, to fit the data for uh, two components. And in summary, while uh, the FAD NADH intensity ratio is well established and standard for adult states, we suggest that a flim based parameter such as the ratio of bound coenzyme, NADH uh, of FAD bound, achieves the same purpose without potential intensity related artifacts. We have demonstrated the flim based redox ratio more advantageous in tissue, in vivo, and the clinical imaging. This non invasive fluid assay and the machine learning can be used to investigate or monitor mitochondrial dysfunction in many diseases. We have also demonstrated the advantages of using single wavelength excitation for NADH and FAD. Single wavelength data compared with our already published biological system for drug treatment. Single wavelength approach may be very convenient for high speed measurement of relax ratio in live specimens. 
thank you very much. And uh, uh, you know, the next meeting on the multi this is on last January 2020 meeting on 30 years of multifold on microscopy. But next meeting is in March. Not sure, still it is not confirmed. It is going to be uh, digital or in person. So thank you very much.